high, horrible, virulent issue, but it is an impact. Uh, and there's, the biggest impact is economic, and that's why the government is interested, not because they care about our bodies, but be care, because they care about money. Seventy million missed work days, which leads to a lot of dollars lost. If you don't go to work, you don't buy the washing machine that you wanted this year. Uh, or you don't go shopping for St. John, like Chicago and I like to do. <laughs> anyway, 38 million missed school days, 3 to 15 billion in direct and indirect costs, and Interestingly, there's been many policy briefs that have come out of governments about the economic impact. Um, here's one um, that was about the economic impact on Asia, which is a fascinating brief if anybody's interested in reading a brief. So if you're, I can give you the reference later. Uh, but it, it describes the economic impact if there was a pandemic in Asia. And it is disastrous. We think we're in an economic disaster now. We're not. So. Avian influenza was first described in chickens in Italy in 1878, actually described. And this is where it's going to get interesting to you because everybody's always wondered, well, why do they call it the swine flu? Why do they call it bird flu? How come humans get it? So this is really easy to explain, and I think you'll really uh, have like an aha moment when you hear about this. Um, it was recognized as a cause of disease outbreak truly recognized on a scientific level in 1955 and innumerable avian influenza strains come from many different bird species and some of those strains are low pathogenicity and some of them are highly pathogenic so when you talk about h5n1 everybody's heard h5n1 that was the one we thought would create a pandemic h5n1 originated in birds and it's highly pathogenic Everybody that gets it dies 100%. So that's where it gets the term highly virulent. That's all that virulent means. Um, avian influenza in birds. So you can get avian influenza in people or avian influenza in birds, okay? That's just the clear distinction there. It has a 3 to 14 day incubate, incubation period and it's highly contagious. And we can get it from bird poop. And birds get it from their own bird poop. Uh, there's low pathogenic, high pathogenic, that's what LPAI means. And if you get the highly pathogenic type, you're dead in 24 hours. The birdie is dead in 24 hours. So it, you, you see how devastating, there's no chance to get any treatment or anything. It's not going to happen. 23 outbreaks have been recognized in the world of avian influenza. Now, this is bird flu in birds I'm talking about, okay, since 1959. So scientists got interested and they said, oh, well, this kills birds. Maybe we better figure out if this can be transmitted to humans. So the better part of last decade they spent trying to figure that out. Um, now we know that H5N1 is a strain of highly pathogenic avian influenza spreading around the world, and that's what brought... Uh, the press interest in influenza. Typically, they just kind of ignore virologists. I know that when I went to Africa, they pretty much ignored us. National Geographic was out there, but most of the time, the regular world is not interested in highly pathogenic things unless it's, it's scary like Ebola virus. And, oh, that sounds cool. Let's put it on TV and let's make a movie outbreak about it. You know, so here's our pleasant little chicken farm here. This is how we all, if you eat chicken that's not free range, this is what they do, okay? They all grow in this huge, and well, this is the nice one. So they all grow in this huge, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, I guess it's a barn, but it, more, it looks more like a warehouse. And they all sit next to each other, and they never get to walk around. And you can imagine if, you're, if you get something that's highly pathogenic, it's, a huge impact. It's 24 hours later, after this population developed avian influenza, this is what it looked like, exact same building. Every bird is dead in less than a day. Now, as you know, we're, we're interested as a society in economies and money, and so because this lost the economy several million dollars worth of chickens, people started looking at it and saying, well, let's figure out why this is happening. It's expensive. And, of course, unfortunately, there's people who would run in there and get all those chickens and say, okay, we just killed them. Let's sell them to all the people. And then you'd eat them. And, unfortunately, this has probably been happening. I don't know how many of you have listened to the news on the way in. Probably a lot of us listened to public radio, and they were talking about chickens and salmonella and eggs and all that. Did everybody hear that? 
Well, the Food and Drug Administration doesn't typically regulate any of this. Obama, thank God, is getting the Food and Drug Administration involved. But chickens like that were sold to us, and we ate them and didn't know it. Okay? So... Avian influenza also recently, and this to me seems like a no-brainer, but we're all always discovering new things every day. Scientists figured out, oh, well, birds can get this, not just chickens. Well, hello, isn't a chicken a bird? Well, duh, it seems to me. Like, when it seemed like if a sparrow went in there, he would get it too, but they had to make a discovery. Then they figured out, okay, seabirds, like all the birds, the seagulls that we see also get avian influenza. What do they do? They fly around. Not only that, but all the little beautiful little finches get it. And, and a lot of the beautiful birds that we see in the springtime travel the entire globe. If anybody's a bird watcher, they know this, but it, otherwise most of us don't know. Like you go through, some, a lot of these birds come right through the Philippines, they come right through Kenya and Africa, and they travel the whole world that we see right here that we're feeding at our bird feeders. So the migratory behavior of wild birds makes it extremely scary and it's a worldwide problem it's not just a problem in the united states this is a map off the who website and you can see here areas of confirmed cases okay of h5n1 in humans what i wanted to point out about this is you see in southeast asia a very large reported area but it's in laos vietnam and cambodia korea which Korea's name is not up here, but the Korean Peninsula is close by. And the reason, there's Korea up there. The reason we don't see reporting in China, I can give you one guess, and everybody's probably going to say politics, because that's what it is. They just don't tell us. But you can see if there's that many people dying in these other countries, it's got to be all over China, and it is. But they don't want to tell us because of their politics not because they don't have a reporting system. Africa, why is Africa empty? Africa's empty because it doesn't have a reporting system. There's no, there's no public health department in Africa. I mean, no, very few countries, the only one really is Nigeria, that even has a system sophisticated enough to track this. So the world is not tracking H5N1. Here are areas reporting the occurrence in birds themselves, whether it's their bird populations like the farm I showed you, or the natural birds, and people in these environments, particularly in the Far East and in Africa, live with their birds. So if you want a chicken, Graham goes out and brings its neck. Same thing in the southern part of this country. If you want chicken, you go out in the garden and you grab a chicken, and you feed them at night from your table scraps, and they come to your front door. So they're living all around you. And remember I said that the virus lives in their droppings. So this, again, is only countries that have substantially uh, supported food and drug administrations that are reporting this, okay? Uh, this is what has happened with confirmed cases since 2003. So the last image was 2008. This is what we've seen since 2003. So we're talking about the last six years, and you can see it spreading from east to west very quickly. Uh, I recently lectured in Korea, and one of their uh, physicians that was in my conference uh, actually put together a study where he looked at WB, which is the wild bird population. He looked at the wild bird population, looked for crossover with the poultry that's being sold in the market, and you could see the tremendous crossover. And that's where and how it gets into the human population. We eat it. So H5N1 in humans, most result from close contact with infected poultry, whether you eat undercooked poultry or you live with their viral droppings. It's rare right now that it's person-to-person -person transmission. The majority of the cases were less than 19 years old that I showed you on that map. The illness starts out as a typical influenza, and then it leads to a viral pneumonia. It's called a cytokine storm. This is the same thing that's happening now with H1N1. We just thought it was going to be H5N1, and it tricked us. It's going to be H1N1. So it could be H5 with a little bit of H1 and a little bit of N1, because remember that first picture? All those viral surface particles, the hemagglutins and the neuramidases, get together and change structure every few days, not weeks. So I'll show you an